Hi. How you doing? Today, we're going to talk about something uh, it's a bit different. That's kind of should be more typical, I guess, because I tend not to do very typical videos. I tend to try and make them niche, as niche as possible. But I think this is one of those times. Um, so we're going to talk about Mamluk armor. What armor did the Mamluk Sultanate use? And we're going to specifically situate ourselves at the time of, say, the Ubids under Sal al Adin, and then also the Mamluk Sultanate, which came afterwards. And to cut a long story short to answer questions, the answer is they were wearing every th what everybody else was wearing at the time. Um, and I'm going to go into detail about what that means. Now, just as a disclaimer, um, this is based on the work Citadel of Damascus collection because there is a collection of um, armor pieces that were discovered in Damascus. That's why it's called the Citadel of Damascus collection. And because of that, um, y you get indications of these. I don't have the work anymore. I gave it away um, due to personal reasons. And because of that, um, I'm not really going to know a lot of the Arabic terms or any of the Arabic terms. So I'm just going to talk using kind of English terms for it, I guess. So uh, I think we'll go through the kind of um, what we might not consider typical and then we'll kind of bring it to the more typical side. I don't know how that's necessarily going to take shape or what exactly would constitute it in that case, but we'll start first with the kind of less obvious one, which is leather armor. Now, leather armor was used uh, across the world in different places. The Romans used leather armor, I believe, for the abdominal protection. Uh, the cavalry, according to David Nicole, from what I remember, uh, the Mongols were avid users of leather armor during their conquest and they adopted the armor used by their neighbors. Um, and also the Arabs and the Mamluks uh, thereafter also used leather armor. The uh, medieval Europeans also used leather armor, especially for tournaments before plate armor. Uh, Kurbuili, as the term is called. And they and the during towards the Renaissance, but also beforehand, uh, I believe the Venetians and medieval Italian states also used it on uh, shields, what we might uh, consider a rotella uh, or rotero, as, as it's known in the Spanish. But if you're a HEMA person, you'll recognize these terms very well. Um, and it's just, um, it's dried leather and it's oiled to made to mold on a particular shape. And it's actually quite interesting because Al Tarsusi, in his treatise to Saladin, from what I remember, has a section. We don't have a translation for it yet. Um, there was an expert in Citadel of Damascus which has um, this instruction on how you can apply leather armor and also, interestingly enough, apply gilding to it. And um, he, he more or less says, and I'm paraphrasing that, uh, the, the the thing about leather is if you oil it correctly and you mold it, you can mold it into anything. So that can be helmet designs, um, that can be uh, whatever you want it to be uh, molded into as a shape. And that's interesting because uh, from the Citadel of Damascus collection, uh, we have uh, remains of what seems to be a helmet. Uh, we have remains of what seem to be uh, scale armor or lamina. And then we have what are appear to be leather strips. But with the leather strips, we're not very sure if that's horse armor or if that's for infantry. It's a bit ambiguous. And I believe the, um, it might be the strips are dated more towards the Abbasid Caliphate and not the Mamluk Sultanate. So towards the ninth century. Alternatively, it might actually be the scale armor. But um, the, the use of leather or more accurately uh, oiled hide is quite useful because it hardens very well. So as a beginner's type of rudimentary um, leather armor, and it might when I say rudimentary, I mean as a basis for basic armor, it's quite useful. It, it, um, tan hide becomes very resilient to cuts or thrusts, and that makes it uh, relatively good armor as well. Now, um, with that in mind, um, it was probably common. We know it was common in the Byzantine case as well. 
uh, sowing the dragon's teeth, which is the translation of two Byzantine treatises at the age of uh, Nikiferos Forkas and also uh, Basil. I think the one for Nikiferos Forkas more so because I've thoroughly read, I've read that one a lot more in any case and I have an understanding of that one. You, there's a video of me doing the recording for it. Uh, talks about um, for horse armor using leather armor. And it's actually interesting because during the siege of Constantinople in 1456, uh, different perspectives talk about uh, the Byzantines or Eastern Roman soldiers using leather jerkins um, or uh, jackets uh, as kind of basic armor. So there's that perspective that um, it's probably something that was a carryover from much earlier designs concerning more basic armor. And if you have um, basic stuff to work with, hide match might actually be incredibly useful. Uh, we'll go on to the next one, mail. Uh, I don't think, I don't know much about mail armor. Uh, it's pretty much anywhere in the um, Euro-Asian landmass, Eurasian landmass, has some form of mail armor. I think uh, the case with uh, Chinese history might be a bit different. Uh, I don't think they particularly adopted mail armor from my understanding. I might be wrong about that. But whether North Africa, the Middle East, uh, Northern Europe, Eastern Roman Empire, um, the, the Norse Vikings all use the form of mail armor. Um, and it's very convenient. Interlocking rings, depending on the design, makes it very suitable to counter against cutting, uh, which is the indication for a lot of early medieval swords. They seem to be more tip heavy and seem to be more cut heavy. Uh, that's not all of them, but that seems to be a large portion of them in any case. So there's that. Uh, there's also laminar armor. Uh, and this is twofold. What we consider traditionally, uh, stereotypically laminar armor, um, which is that it is um, a range of scales or plates, small plates um, that are sewn into the fabric of something on the outside um, uh, in kind of lines. You see this with uh, Byzantine armor. It was certainly the case with Abbasid and Mamluk armor as well. And um, it just creates a nice kind of proto coat of plates that molds very well with the body. Um, we have indications from my understanding that uh, both cavalrymen maybe infantry if they're high quality or high class, and also cavalry would have worn this. We certainly have that with later Mamluk stuff going into the Ottoman stuff from my understanding, could be wrong about that. Um, but uh, kind of with the, the earlier you get, and certainly with the Mamluk Sultanate, um, kind of at the time of the Ubids in any case, um, and with the decline of the Abbasid Caliphate, my understanding would be, you know, um, with the decline of this kind of geographically large empire, there's less metal to go around and metalworking, uh, which means that you might have less laminar armor um, going around. Now, that might stabilize in the time of the Crusades, or that might stabilize in the time of the Mamluk Sultanate, certainly when the Mamluks were winning a lot more. And when they had finally driven out the Crusaders from uh, what's perceived to be the Holy Land. Um, so it, it's just a lot more convenient. There's more stabilized trading, though that doesn't seem to last very long. But at the same time, it's possible that this type of armor would have um, persisted anyway, but would have been designed for the heavily armored cavalry. Uh, who might have been the elite of the elite of even the Mamluks themselves, the royal companions. Um, so you have that. The second one is you have what are called brigandines. Um, they weren't only limited to the uh, Western European context. Um, they seem to have, we have one surviving um, evident piece that seems to have survived. It's got a uh, color wise it's got a stripe design going downwards uh, linear uh, as I was saying uh, stripe design it, the, 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 the brigandine seems to have a stripe design color wise going down linearly and because of that um, 
It looks quite snazzy, actually. Um, but the uh, l plates inside are, I think, I don't believe they're overlapping from what I remember, um, but they, they seem to be lined up very well and stitched in to create this very form-fitting overlapping plate, which is uh, tied together in the front as well. Um, so you have that as well. Um, and I think the last one, as far as I can remember, apart from scale armor, is gambesons. So uh, padded jackets or gambesons were likely used. Um, we, we kind of have indications of gambesons um, being used going all the way up to kind of when the British were fighting in Sudan anyway. Um, uh, and it's kind of a very basic type of armor. We know that the Byzantines wrote down about it and uh, in all likeliness from David Nicole's work, kind of the stitching and material that we have, I think from surviving um, evidence has that uh, things like paddy gambesons were used as well, both for horses and also for the riders as well. Um, so e even when the Europeans were going on crusades, sometimes based on the armor, it might be difficult to distinguish who is who. Now, with that being said, um, when these types of armors were being used, um, they were done in a specific designed way so that the you because of the stylistic way in which these were designed it might be difficult it might not be difficult to distinguish between crusaders and quote unquote saracens as well um but the these types of designs seem to have survived um likely um as metallurgy becomes a lot better towards the end of the mamluk sultanate um, there is more of a transference towards kind of maybe more metal designs, uh, that being kind of uh, more laminar armor, um, especially for horses and scale designs. We certainly have surviving pieces um, of Mamluk armor, which indicate that's the case, especially for heavy horses um, going into the Ottoman period. Um, but certainly in the medieval period, uh, the type of armor that was used was probably not all that different from European types of armor. Even in the, like the height of the Abbasid Caliphate, uh, that's likely not the case. Uh, now, with the Abbasid Caliphate, we don't know necessarily if um, the uh, brigandine was used. I don't think there's sufficient evidence to support that. So it might be this kind of symbiotic uh relationship that comes out of the design of um such an armor which is why we might see it more in the mamluk collection and not really have a lot of surviving examples alternatively such armor could have just been reused um like a lot of swords get rehealed and repurposed so it's it's equally uh that might be the case as well uh we, we really don't have it and i don't really want to confirm because i don't have adequate knowledge to uh, confirm or deny that that is the case um but it, it's interesting to see that the the types of armor are overall not that different um and that can be either through what's called convergent evolution where out of similar circumstances things that are designed stay uh develop quite similarly um it can also develop out of a um, a synthesis with um, meeting outsiders such as in the Crusades or it can just be the fact that and from interaction or it can just be the fact that they were developed um, individually in isolation uh, we don't really know we have some evidence of some sword designs being brought back uh, according to David Nicole from European like frescoes which show different design swords uh f in the south of france from what we consider typical arming swords at the time which means that there was some influence uh you might bring it home as kind of a trophy or kind of as something that's seen as more exotic or it just might look really nice and you just want to bring it back with you uh, unfortunately there isn't a lot of designs we we know from the arsenal at alexandria that european swords were taken and towards the um end of the Mamluk Sultanate a lot of the blades that were being imported were European just because of the quality of the blade and also you need to remember that this is from the ruins of the Abbasid Caliphate um, 
So kind of like how you similarly you would see the ruins of the Roman Empire, which means all that trade network to do with um, metallurgy and and uh, connections to do with trading. To do with that metal is going to decrease as well as things become more fractured, uh, especially with the Crusades and also um, with a lot of stuff being destroyed, cities being plundered, whatever. Um, that's likely going to be an attributing factor. Um, so yes, the 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 uh, the answer with the Abbasids and the Mamluks is they wore armor just like everybody else. Um, there there really isn't any um, kind of magic that was used uh, in terms of unique armor designs. Um, the they were the Abbasids and the Mamluks were just as conscious about protection as everybody else. In fact, because of the societies being somewhat more centralized and somewhat more um, orientated to having these elite slave guard soldiers, um, they would need to have this heavy cavalry slash horse archers who could maneuver on the field but be well protected at the same time. So they would need to gear those cavalry to having the right sort of armor which is where you get these state-run armories, for example, that would have existed in the Mamluk Sultanate, and also, for example, in the Eastern Roman context as well, because Constantinople had their own armory. Um, so I think it's interesting. I think it's something that uh, brings into perspective kind of um, how similar everything was to everyone else in terms of what they were using, whether it's the weapon, whether it's the function of the weapons and whether it is the protection and the armor that is not only being worn but utilized as well because armor I in particular is a util is is operated like it, it works similarly to how in science fiction you have an exosuit you operate an exosuit in the same way you operate armor and that's the words of Tobias Catwell as uh, something which I agree with so anyway, I hope this I've rambled on for nearly 20 minutes. Uh, I hope this has been somewhat interesting and thank you very much.